Uh, well, Laura gave a little history, and I want to thank Laura and the Erie Art Museum for hosting this show. I'm just going to give a really super brief history. You know, uh, there's four sisters in this show. We grew up in a family of six kids. Our parents were educators in languages and literature. And all of us, except my single brother, uh, studied art, and four of us remain artists. And we decided uh, over 20 years ago that we would show together in a show called Flesh and Blood, and that went to Pittsburgh, Raleigh, but Miami, and Hong Kong. And then in 2020, just before, just before COVID, uh, we, we came up with this idea to show again. And the show actually premiered in New Zealand, where my sister Madeline lives, with the title Family Tree Faka Papa, which Faka Papa in, Ma in the Maori language is about your relationship to community and context in the environment. But we thought that was too complicated for the United States to use. So um, it went to uh, Masterton and Auckland in New Zealand, and it premiered in the U.S. Uh, it's touring now in the USA. It premiered last fall at SUNY Cortland's Dowd Gallery, and we're really happy that the Erie Art Museum has its own distinct version because it changes with every venue. Um, and um, yeah, so that's why it's here. And you know, we all, all four of us make work about a lot of different things, but trees were the one, were a theme that, you know, connected us and we, we that's why uh, we arranged uh, this particular show. So I'm gonna start with Madeline because I think this work, which is called Parking Lot Conversation, is actually emblematic of the show because it is meant to be a kind of conversation and talking and seeing about trees. And you can see these two snippets from two prior poets or writers in 1940, Bertolt Brecht asked, you know, what kind of times are they when to talk about a tree is almost a crime because it implies silence about so many horrors. And then decades later, Adrian Rich answers, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. So here you see these two trees in a New Zealand parking lot. They're completely marginalized. And in fact, these trees, you know, they're so un they're unhealthy, they've got these browning sections, but they're kind of still sort of reaching out, like trying to almost commune in some kind of natural connection. In fact, these trees no longer exist in this parking lot. She's asked, you know, wh where, what they're gonna do, and they said they're gonna replant, but they haven't yet. Um, so I do see them as a kind of nice introduction to the whole show. And if we move over here, you'll see this other cluster of photographs by Madeline. Uh, Madeline has lived in the United States several decades in Hong Kong, and now she lives in rural New Zealand. So she's lived in suburbia, super urban Hong Kong, and really in the boonies in New Zealand. And so this is called Lattice, and she thinks of it as a kind of, um, really a kind of record of all of her memories and experiences of trees, which she sees as performing in different roles as kinds of signs or markers and, and totems or shadows and signs or trees that are like front and center or totally sidelined. Um, and they, 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 they in, as a kind of constellation, they're almost a kind of diary of her life. Yeah. Um, and she, is really actually, she, is, she didn't study art, but she came to photography and she's also a published poet and has uh, founded a press and so on. But this is a prose poem. I'm gonna read just little snippets of poetry in this walkthrough. This is her prose poem called Every Tree Has a Story. A woman climbs five trees on her first date, but when a papaya tree is mounted, a broken leg. I've never been to the top of any tree yet long for the bed there, the air there. And one dusk when I wake on a faraway bus, three camels are walking along a row of sticks that are young poplar. Do I believe in red pine, white pine, black pine, brown? Can I tell the manuka from the kanuka? There's probably a house behind that hedge of holly, eucalypt, box, shaven or not. Lost in the bush, a man eats watercress and cabbage tree for three days, pads his clothes with burns, dead log as a bed. His compass went missing, but he finds the antlers he left behind last season. A friend in the city lives near drug dealers and three sycamore. 
large sounds of leaves and cars. Our evenings are murmurations of starling, then the hush. Human urine burns the cherry, but boosts the citrus. And the apple tree, windblown to 40 degrees, can still bear. The cabbage tree is not cabbage and not a large lily, and I first saw the tree in another hemisphere and called it a palm. Pull a frond from the trunk, and a wita might fall. The moon rises near the macrocarpa by the creek. Plovers screech, ruru in the pine, prepare their call. So it kind of gives you an impressionistic, you know, her, of her uh, view of her mindset. So um, let's move over to my sister Sarah's work. So all of these works on paper here and the large paintings down there and on the other side of this wall are all from a series called Elegy to the Underground. Sarah um, is the third girl in, a, uh, in the row of us and uh, she was actually an artist before any of us. She was teaching kids uh, when she was a kid in the basement of our house in Milwaukee and uh, she now teaches at uh, Leslie University in Boston. And all of us have read, some of you may have too, Richard Powers' book, The Older Story, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2019. It is a really powerful novel. I really highly recommend it. And there are excerpts from it in the poetry booklet that I made that's on the table back there that is a collection of poems about trees. But his characters in that book talk about how trees survived before us and they're going to survive long after us. And it kind of revels in all the wonders of their biology and ecologies and what is happening both above ground and below ground. And Sarah has been particularly interested in what happens underground, it's elegy to the underground, in the um, kind of lattice fungi and the mycorrhizal networks that a lot has been written about recently and how trees communicate with each other, not just their own species, but other species as well. And, and how this hidden life underground, we don't see all this stuff that's going on, um, actually offers kind of compelling strategies for our own social behavior. You know, if we would, they have all these infinite pathways and alliances and network kinships that, you know, allow them to grow to enormity and increase their chances for survival and, and ours as a consequence because trees are the lungs of the earth and help keep us alive. Um, so all of these works she sees as kind of tributes and memorials to trees that have been before us, the trees that we are losing and continue to lose. I mean, the rate of deforestation is truly amazing. If you read that novel by Annie Crew called Bark Skins, it just talks about the pillaging of the earth of trees and how trees were equated with the wilderness and wilderness was evil and had to be conquered. And, and that mindset has really, um, you know, created this deforestation. Um, so, but in the spirit of Sarah's work, I wanted to read uh, one essay from Ross Gay's Book of Delights. And this essay is essay number 60. It's called Joy is Such a Human Madness, The Duff Between Us. Because in trying to articulate what perhaps joy is, it has occurred to me that among other things, the trees and the mushrooms have shown me this. Joy is the mostly invisible the underground union between us, you, and me, which is, among other things, the great fact of our life and the lives of everyone and thing we love going away. <clears throat> if we sink a spoon into that fact, into the duff between us, we will find it teeming. It will look like all the books ever written. It will look like all the nerves in a body. We might call it sorrow, but we might call it a union, one that once we notice it, once we bring it into the light, might become flower and food, might be joy. So Ellen is the, um, the youngest sister and the youngest child in the family, and um, she retired early as a distinguished professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and is now an artist in residence at University of California, Irvine. And last year, she had a Huntington Art and Research Fellowship at Caltech. And at Caltech, she had access to this abandoned dark room that had all this leftover paper and chemicals that they said, go ahead, use it. We're getting rid of it all after you leave. And so she really went to town. And this is actually the newest work in this whole cluster. And it's, uh, it's called 
There have been 528 nuclear tests to date, and these are just a few of them. And uh, the reason she made these, well, several reasons that she made these about nuclear tests is because Caltech was instrumental in the development of atomic weaponry. Um, Oppenheimer was there, and there's, you know, all kinds of incredible archival materials there that she had access to. And she made a whole bunch of work about that too. But these were really kind of intuitive and spontaneous and literally pouring and drawing with the chemicals on this paper, making these mushroom clouds, which it's not too hard to see that they also look like trees, which is not surprising. They seem to be a natural extension of these more recognizable trees that you see behind you in, um, they are, uh, trees that were bombed uh, in, by the atomic bomb in, in uh, Hiroshima. Uh, the, the ones on the ends here are um, persimmon trees uh, that are laden with contaminated fruit in Fukushima after that nuclear power uh, di uh, disaster. Um, and uh, also her husband is an uh, epidemiologist of nuclear, of the effects of nuclear radiation. So. She, she has access to a lot of information that way as well. Um, and then the cyanotypes you see, the works on blue and black paper, the leaves, these are all leaves from trees that, have, uh, that she laid on paper. These are actual leaves from trees that did survive the atomic blast. And, and the people in Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki yeah, are very um, reverent toward these trees and take care of them. They prop them up with these poles they put netting over the holes and allow people to climb up on ladders to see what's in those holes, like the stuff that remains. They're, they're very protective of these trees. So she's done a lot of work uh, with the artifacts, also from the Peace Museum in Hiroshima. She did a light test to see if any of the lingering mm -hmm. radiation would expose the paper, but it's very, very minimal. And she's very interested, too, in the history of photography and how it's linked to radiation and discoveries of radiation that also you know, became intrinsically connected to photography. Um, so, and these are actual, actual leaves that she brought back with her from trees that have survived the atomic blast. Oh, I did want to say one line about Ellen. It's from a, it's not really that much about trees, a, a novel I mean, Zora Neale Hurston, she wrote a beautiful novel called Their Eyes Were Watching God. And if you ever get a chance to listen to it on audio tape, Ruby D reads, reads it, and it is just incredible. But there's one line or two lines. It says, it just comes to mind when I look at Ellen's work. Janie saw her life like a great tree and leaf with the things suffered, things enjoyed, things done and undone. Dawn and dew was in the branches. So I think there's both kind of destruction and recovery in that, in the, as it is in Ellen's work as well. So as Laura mentioned, I'm an artist and curator that's based in Pittsburgh. I'm just recently retired from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, my work over a lot of different themes has really been a lot about damage that we do to each other and to the environment and the possibilities of recovery or the impossibilities. And uh, in this case, these two paintings here are called, they're both called Recuperation, Nocturnal, Diurnal. And I saw these Cedars of Lebanon on a tour of Italy, Lake Como, some island. There was a freak windstorm. And when we got there, the, the workers were like frantically trying to revive these trees with these guy wires and sprinkler systems and wrapping the trees with bandages where the limbs had been torn off. And I, because it was in 2007 when we were, there were wars in Lebanon, Afghanistan, and Iraq, I was seeing these kind of as a metaphor of, of violence, whether it's man-made or natural, and our attempts to heal or um, recover. And also, you know, trees are often planted to the war dead or to other people who have passed and I see them as kind of memorials to the wounded, but also with some hopes for recovery. And um, that is kind of true as well about my series on the other side of this wall, if you could just humor me and walk around here. So yeah, this is, um, these are from my Tree of Life series. And what I did is I, um, 
was looking at carpet designs from around the world, and there are, uh, there's a motif in a lot of these uh, cultural, uh, these designs uh, called the Tree of Life. And so I extracted the Tree of Life design from those carpets and then hand painted those in gouache over these photographic scenes of environmental um, depredation, whether it's from logging or forest fire or other insults, you know, to the land or the environment. I mean, that's Yellowstone over there. This is Chile. This is Minnesota for logging. This is uh, this is Nepal. This is uh, New South Wales and Australia. This is in Canada. Yeah. Anyway, um, but in painting the trees of life standing up, well, you know, we all think of carpets lying down, right, on the ground. You walk on that, but I wanted these trees to stand up as a kind of act of persistence and resistance in spite of the environment that they're in. Um, so, you know, again, it's sort of an acknowledgement to the environmental ruin, but I'm hoping that there is this kind of um, modicum of hope, I should say. And so I, I also want to invoke Richard Powers once more because there's all these beautiful sec sections in the book, but he says, he just reminds us a lot in this novel that this is not our world with trees in it. It's a world of trees where humans have just arrived. And I just want to end with a few more lines that's from a different part in the novel, but he says, as a character says, that's the trouble with people, their root problem. Life runs alongside them on scene, right here, right next, creating the soil, cycling water, trading in nutrients, making weather, building atmosphere, feeding and curing and sheltering more kinds of creatures than people know how to count. A chorus of living wood sings to the woman, if your mind were only a slightly greener thing, we drown you in meaning. The pine she leans against says, listen, there's something you need to hear. And I guess I'd like to say that I, I, want, I think my sisters and I want to say, look, there's something you need to see. And to end there, I just want to repeat, when you have time, and if you can come back to the show, there's a lot of poems to read. There's other literature there. And I invite you to peruse those. Um, the catalog from the premier version in New Zealand is available, I think, down in the store. And there's a, some books here that are almost free or free. The R&R&R and, &R and, &R and the Out of Rubble. I have excess copies. Please take them <laughs> and my try to like the exception. So thanks again for, for coming. And also I'm open to any questions you might have. So don't be shy. Mm -hmm.